Conversation with the Candidate continues right now. Thank you for clicking on our extended conversation with the candidate with the candidate this evening, uh, Democratic candidate for president, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We have our studio audience of New Hampshire voters here with their questions. We'll get to as many of those as we can. But for those of you picking us up from television here in the last half hour, we had Mr. Kennedy talking about the issue of immigration. Mr. Kennedy, you've been to the border. You've seen the crossings coming across. Really, this is a massive humanitarian crisis. So as president, what would you do about it? Yeah, can I describe it first, yeah. kind of what I saw? Because I went. I flew down to Yuma, and then uh, and then at one o'clock arrived at the one o'clock a.m. arrived at the um, at the uh, at the border, and the the first group that when I arrived there there was a group coming across of about I think it was two busloads was about a hundred and uh, and maybe about a hundred people um, who were all West Africans. So I had expected I'd see a lot of Central Americans, people from Salvador and Panama and Guatemala, um, but that's not what it was. It was all Africans, African men, military age. Most of them were from Senegal. Next group that came across uh, was, and they're, they're just waiting in line to cross. Hundreds and hundreds of people. They come in buses of 55 each, and they're, they're let off about a half mile, and then they walk to the, the gap in the fence and they walk around. The next group, I went and talked to them, and they were, there was only two families that were from Latin America, one from Colombia, one from Peru. The rest were from Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tibet, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Nepal, China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Eastern Europe, and What's happening, you know, what it took, and, and as I said, it's the insanity of it. They're brought across, they're fingerprinted to see if they have criminal records. If they don't, they're asked one question by the Border Patrol, do you have a contact in this country? And if they say yes, the Border Patrol says, can you put us on the phone with that contact? If they can do that, if they can get them on a cell phone, the Border Patrol asks them, if we put this family on an airplane, will you pick them up at Minneapolis or you know, or San Diego or um, or, uh, or Chicago or New York? And if that person says yes, and they take them to the airport, FEMA pays for their ticket, and they go anywhere they want in the country. Seven million people have come across. The cartels control all the immigration, and they have shifted from drug smuggling to make this one of their big um, you know, profit lines. So they are sending videos, social video, social media videos all over the world, recruiting people from countries. They have lawyers who are working with them in other countries, they, they, and they tell them exactly what to do. You get on a plane to Mexico City, the, uh, the cartels help you get a visa in Mexico City for Mexico. They then put you on an internal plane to Mexicali. The cartels have a, a parking lot filled with buses at Mexicali. You get on one of those buses and then they drive you to the, um, you know, to the, to the crossing and there are nine big crossings. So, and the one I went to was in Yuma and you know, the night I went there probably six to 800 people came across. And, uh, and the, uh, the little town of Yuma is bearing a lot of the initial burden because a lot of these people are sick, so they go to the hospital. There's a lot of pregnant women. I talked to them. The, uh, I spent a day with the head of the hospital, and he said that a few months ago, there were so many pregnant immigrants in his hospital. They occupied 32 of the 35 beds on the maternity ward, and a lot of local women who had scheduled pregnancy inductions, you know, induced, induced births, um, C-sections, whatever, could not get in, had to cancel or postpone their appointments. He said that he spent $27 million of the hospital's budget last year unreimbursed to take care of the immigrants. And, that, you know, we talked with the sheriff who, said, who told us because the entire Border Patrol is now processing people, there's nobody guarding the border and the drugs are pouring across through the other place. If you're a smuggler or a bad guy, you don't come through that fence around that fence. These are all people who intend to stay in this country. They, when they stay, they're given a court, case, a court date seven years from now. 
And, I, and so, and meanwhile, there's a million immigrants who, who are legally coming here, 1.1 million immigrants who go through the whole process, which could take them eight or 10 years. And this is like a stick in the face for them. So, you know, no country can survive if it can't, if it, if it can't control its borders, and we're not doing that. The good news is this, that everybody that I talked to there said that this is easy to stop. That the way to stop it is very, very simple, and that they've been doing it before. Now, I didn't like to hear this because I don't, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump's. I did not like his wall. But what the Border Patrol and the, everybody else said is, you don't need to build a physical barrier from San Diego, 2,200 miles to Brownsville, Texas. You do need a physical barrier in certain places where there's high density populations. The rest of it you can monitor with, uh, with ground monitoring, very, very sophisticated surveillance and ground monitoring systems. Many of those were put up during the Trump administration, but for some reason, the Biden administration, when it came in, took down the towers and they removed the ground sensing systems. This is not something that, as a Democrat, that I want to hear. And, and then, you know, once it got out that this is an open border and the, the cartels saw that there's a huge profit um, opportunity here, uh, the, the flow has just increased exponentially. And, but we can stop it during the Trump administration. The crossings at Yuma were about 10 to 25 a day at most. Now, as I said, they're, you know, they're 200 to 800 a day. So, you know, we can solve this problem, but we need to do it in a way that's sensible, that's common sense, and that, uh, that is not causing this terrible, terrible humanitarian crisis. Uh, from where I sat on the border, there's a tree that you can see on the other side of the fence, but it's in U.S. territory. It's called the rape tree. And it's where the cartels extract their final payment from women who come across, sometimes from children. Uh, the, the Border Patrol watches helplessly why they do this. I talked to people, you know, this Peruvian family that I talked to that had lost their life savings because the, the, the cartels robbed them, they beat them, they extort them, they exploit them, and ultimately they raped them. And, you know, this is a humanitarian crisis that we, uh, that, uh, you know, that we're creating through government negligence, and we need to end it for everybody's sake. Let's get to a question from Ken Berlin. I'm not Mr. Kennedy. Welcome. Uh, this kind of dovetails with your uh, vaccine thoughts or whatever. I was glad to hear what you said up there. But uh, when we get our next pandemic, like we had with COVID, how would you attack that? How would you try to get the country squared away so that we wouldn't be uh, suffering like we did in the last one? Uh, I mean, the answer to that is I would do uh, the pandemic preparedness protocols from WHO, CDC, the European Medical Association, the NHS, National Health Service in England, have said for decades, which is you quarantine, you don't do mass lockdowns ever. You quarantine the sick, you isolate the vulnerable, and, you, um, and then you look for particularly uh, uh, for off-the-shelf therapeutic drugs that treat the illness. You don't lock everybody in and say you're waiting for a vaccine that is untested and that, you know, nobody knows whether it's going to work or not. You actually treat people who are sick. This is the first respiratory illness in the history of medicine where you could go into the hospital with a positive PCR test and symptomatic. And the hospital will say, there is nothing we're going to do for you. You go home till your lips turn blue until you can't breathe, and then come back here, and we're going to give you two things that will kill you, intubation and remdesivir. Meanwhile, we're depriving people of drugs that are proven, of Zithromax, of ivermectin, of hydroxychloroquine, that were proven. The countries that use those drugs had a fraction of the deaths we did. Why is it, if what we were doing worked, why did we have the highest body count of any country in the world? We have 4.2% of the global population. How in the world did we get 16% of the COVID deaths? It doesn't make any sense. Meanwhile, nations that, get, that avoided vaccines and gave their populations ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, and other early treatments, many of them didn't even have a pandemic. Nigeria, Nigeria, 
is, has the highest malaria burden in the world. So almost all the population is on hydroxychloroquine. They take it once a week. It's called Sunday Sunday. Everybody takes it on Sunday. And it also has the highest river blindness burden in the world. So a lot of the half the, or large part of the population is on ivermectin. The death rate in Nigeria was 14 people per million population. The death rate in our country was 3,000 per million population, 200 times what they had in Nigeria. Nigeria had a 1.3% vaccination rate. So it wasn't vaccines that had anything to do with ending the pandemic. If you look across the board, the countries that were the heavily, most heavily vaccinated had the highest death rates from COVID consistently. The, those that had lower vaccines and depended in, instead on, uh, on therapeutic drugs did much better. In fact, there's states in India, there's a state called Kerala that adopted our protocols and had death rates similar to ours. The nearby state of Uttar Pradesh, which has 230 million people, so it, its population is comparable to the United States. As soon as they started giving people ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, the pandemic ended there. We should be, what we should have done is we should have, instead of using the internet to suppress debate, to censor people, to punish doctors who are speaking out and saying, we should be using early treatments. I'm giving it to my patients and they're recovering miraculously. Those people, these, these doctors of conscience, were silenced. We should do the opposite. We should have a, we should have built a grid, and this is what I'll do, that reaches all 15 million frontline physicians in the world and where they report what they're doing and what's working and what's not working and all that information then gets synthesized through AI. So we can quickly spit out to all the other practicing physicians, this is what they're doing in Bangladesh and they've eliminated it, or this is what they're doing in China or Guatemala or Central America. And, but we didn't do any of that. Instead, we, we used the pandemic as a pretext for clamping down these you know, controls on, uh, you know, on our freedoms and, um, and to promote med medication that didn't work. I mean, one of the things that people should know, the government, the, the people who were promoting the vaccine had to get rid of all the competitive products. And why is that? Because there's a federal law, the Code of Federal Regulations, that says if you, that you cannot give an emergency use authorization to any vaccine, if there is an existing medicine that has shown to be effective against the target disease. So that's why they had to tell us that ivermectin was a horse medication that didn't work. It's not a horse medication. It is given to horses because it works for all mammals. But it, it won the no, it's one of the only products in the world that has won the Nobel Prize because it was effective for humans. It's been given in billions and billions of doses, and it's eliminated uh, river blindness and other parasites around the world. We should have focused on things that work rather than focusing on advancing the mercantile interests of the pharmaceutical industry. Next Thank question you. from Spencer Beck. Hi, sir. Thanks for being here. Should nuclear technology play a role in our country's transition to cleaner and more sustainable sources of energy? I'm all for nuclear energy if it can be made. Uh, if it can be made safe, and if it can be made economically competitive. Right now, it's not safe, and, it, and you shouldn't take my word for it. You should take the word of the insurance industry, which is the ultimate arbiter of risk in this country. The insurance companies will not insure nuclear power. And so, yeah, so the nuclear industry had to go to Congress in a sleazy legislative maneuver in the middle of the night and price the, pass the Price-Anderson Act, of which immunizes, essentially immunizes the nuclear industry from, the, uh, from accountability for its own accidents. Oh, my, in my house in Mount Kisco, New York, which was 22 miles from Indian Point Power Plant, I had a provision in my home insurance policy that says this policy does not cover you uh, for radiation damage from a uh, nuclear power plant accident. Oh, all of the home insurance policies in this country have something essentially like that. Oh, you are bearing the burden of their risk, and they, and, and they, they don't have to pay any attention to risk because the, comp the country has immunized them. The other thing is, is it, is it economic? Uh, no. 
the, the last nuclear power plant built at a price per gigawatt hour of $14 billion per, not per gigawatt production uh, capacity. So a, a solar plant right now costs, the construction cost costs about a billion dollars a gigawatt. A, um, a wind plant costs about 1.1 billion a gigawatt. A, uh, a coal plant costs about 3.6 a gigawatt. Um, so, you know, the, a solar plant costs one fourteenth of what a new plant costs. And uh, we, you know, we could make energy by burning prime rib if we wanted, but it wouldn't make any sense. And, uh, and, uh, um, and then, once you build a solar wind plant, it's free energy forever, because the electrons are hitting the earth for free. All we're doing is building a system to pick them up and harvest them. Once you build a new plant, then you have to go do uranium mining at very, very expensive. You have to have regular outages. You have to hire, uh, you know, do safety and, and technicians that are, that are ruinously expensive. And then you have to dispose of the waste and take care of it for the next 30,000 years, which is five times the length of recorded human history. Oh, how can it possibly be economic? It's pretty, but if they make, if they figure out those problems, they told us when they first built these plants they would, that nuclear energy would be too cheap to meter. It's turned out to be the most prohibitively expensive way to buy a boil a pot of water that's ever been devised. And now they're saying, well, don't worry, we've got a new generation of nukes that solve a lot of these problems. And my answer to that is, show us. Show us that, you know, number one, no nuclear facility will be built anywhere in the world unless no utility will build any, unless the public subsidizes essentially the entire cost of construction. That's not, that's not competitive. They should pay for all of their costs, including the disposal of their ways, which was a lesson we were all supposed to have learned in kindergarten. And, um, and you know, not tell the public, if they, if they can do it without public assistance and if they can be competitive in a marketplace, I'm all for them. Thank you. Next question from Karen Manaski. Hi, Karen. Thank you for taking my question. Um, our world is really a mess. Our country is a mess. People are um, angry and hurting each other. And so my question to you is, how would you as president unite us as Americans? Uh, the question is, how um, would I unite people and sort of end the polarization? You know, my dad had faced the same thing when he ran for president against, uh, against the sitting president of his own party, the same as I'm doing, mm -hmm. in 1968. And, you know, my father um, made a, and he succeeded in uniting the country the day that he died. He won the most rural state in our country, South Dakota, and the most urban state, California. And he had succeeded in bridging that gap. And this was at a time that was almost as polarized as we are today because of the Vietnam War, civil rights, our cities were burning. Um, you know, the National Guard was, was federalized and was shooting students on campuses. So it was really a, a, a very, very hard time in our history and nearly as much polarization. My father did this by uh, by telling the truth to people, and and they, he was, he was running at a time when he when when he decided to run, run he was running for moral reason, because of the Vietnam War. He did not believe that he he didn't want to run. He didn't think he could win. He was going to sit it out, but he he worried that somebody would put a microphone in his face and say, "Are you for Eugene McCarthy?" Who he did not like. Who he saw was in the tank with the insurance companies or Lyndon Johnson, who he couldn't support because of the war, or Na Richard Nixon, and he couldn't support any of them. And so he felt like the only thing he could do that was honest and forthright was to run himself, even though he had no chance to win. He'd run his brother's campaign eight years before, and, uh, but then they had the unions on their side, they had the big city mayors, they had the liberal newspapers like the New York Times, all of those were against my father. The only unions he had was the UAW and the, and the you know, Cesar Chavez, United Farm Workers. And all the people who had been with him when he ran the first time and had gone into the new frontier were now working for Johnson. So he was really alone when he decided to run. And, and yet, and, and it freed him to tell the truth to people. So when he went to 
great university in Indiana, and the students say, are, are you going to preserve our, our draft deferments? He t uh, uh, McCarthy said, yeah. He said, no, I'm not, because 45% of the paratroopers in Vietnam are black. And it's unfair. I can get my kids into college and get the deferment. And it's unfair and wrong in our country that our wars are being fighting by black kids who can't get, their, can't get to buy that deferment. And he was booed. And you know, he said, how does that sit with your Catholic values? Mm. And he, he engaged him in that discussion. In the end, he was given a standing ovation. When he went to the Indiana, or to the, um, Indiana Medical School, he, the students asked him, who's going to pay for your health care? And he said, you are. And they booed him. By the end of that conversation, they were applauding him. When he went to Watts, you know, which was on fire, he talked to them about the importance of abiding by the law which was not a popular thing you know, in those communities. When he went to the University of Alabama, which he had forcibly integrated five years before uh, by sending the, federalizing the National Guard, sending 18,000 troops down there, he talked about civil rights. He was given a standing ovation. When I was with him when he died in Los Angeles, and we brought him back to New York, uh, to in New York to wake him at St. Patrick's Cathedral, and then we took him on this ride from Penn Station in, in Manhattan to Union Station in Washington, D.C. It was supposed to be a two and a half hour ride. It was seven and a half hours because there, uh, there were two and a half million people on that train track, and they were the entire cross-section of the American experience when we went through the urban train stations that crawled through at two miles an hour, through Newark, uh, uh, Trenton, uh, Wilmington, Baltimore, there were black faces, tens of thousands of them, singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Um, in, the, in the countryside, there were whites, there were Catholics, there were rabbis, there were priests. I remember seven nuns standing in the back of a pickup truck right outside of Will, Wilmington, Ray, waving their rosaries at us when I passed, little leaguers standing at attention, uh, Boy Scouts, and, um, and it was the cross-section of the American experience. And I remember four years later reading, um, uh, I was going to college by then, and I was reading demographic data from that election from 1972, where, McGovern, where George McGovern had run, who was aligned with my father on every issue. And what this data showed is that those white people who had lined that track to was say goodbye to my dad and who had supported him in the election four years later were not supporting George McGovern, who was aligned with my dad on everything. Instead, they were supporting George Wallace, who was antithetical to everything my father believed in. He was a racist, a bigot, a, you know, a segregationist. And it occurred to me then, and it, it has struck me many times since, that every nation, like every individual, is, has a darker side and a lighter side, and that the easiest thing for a politician to do is to appeal to our bigotry and our hatred and our anger and our greed and xenophobia and tribalism. And that my father tried to do something different, which is to appeal to our populist impulses and instincts, but do it by finding our better natures, by getting us to step outside of our own narrow self-interest, to transcend that and to see ourselves as part of a larger community, part of this kind of noble experiment in you know, the American experiment in self-governance to help us find a hero in each of us and take the risks that it takes to stand up for something, for a community that may not look all like you, and to avoid the seduction of the notion that we can advance ourselves as a people by leaving our poor brothers and sisters behind. And he was able to do that, and he did it successfully. And I, you know, I, every populist movement can be hijacked by, you know, by demagogues who are appealing to our darker angels. And that the challenge is the challenge that I hope to manifest is to, uh, is to persuade Americans that we are part of a community and that we, there's ways that by, by focusing not on the issues that keep us apart, but for, on the values that unite us that we have in common to run a campaign that focuses on those values and focuses on solutions that are going to work for everybody, rather than the narrow tribalistic solutions that you know, have been part of the debate so far. 
And that's why I don't take the easy, you know, democratic answer on gun control, because it hasn't worked so far. It just hasn't worked. It's just divided us. We all, but, but what's the thing we have in common? We all want to protect our children. So let's figure out a way to do that that doesn't impede on somebody's deeply held values, other Americans' deeply held values. And if we start trusting each other again, maybe ultimately we can get gun control, sensible common sense gun control through consensus, rather than forcing it down people's throats. So that's what I hope to do with my campaign. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy, next question from Susan Wilkinson. Hi, thank you for having the courage and backbone to tell the American voters the truth. And I hopefully you will be able to heal the divide. My question is, many former registered Democrats are hesitant to rejoin the party to vote for you given the past history of the DNC. This year they have already stated Biden is the candidate for the ticket. What would you say to these voters? How can you fight an entity that can decide what candidate will be on the ballot regardless of what voters want it? Well, you know, what I would say is uh, you, you know, the voter has a choice. You can come out to the, uh, to the poll and you can support somebody who is not the DNC's choice. And I agree with you. We're, you know, we're living in a time in American history where there's so, you know, I, January 6th was a terrible, terrible moment in our history. The people who broke the law should go to jail or should be punished, you know, in whatever way is appropriate. But we need to look at kind of one of the larger messages, which is there's a huge group of people in this country who believe that the system is rigged against them and that the election system is rigged and it's not functioning. The same, I'm sure you weren't there on January 6th, but you just said the same thing to me. You said that you don't believe that the that is democracy is working, that we're no longer the party of the New Deal, we're the party of the rigged deal. And that, you know, we're picking candidates the way the Soviet Union did, which is that, you know, the party says, here's who you can vote for and here's not. And we ought to, at this point in history, when there's so many people like you and then people on the other side who, you know, who were at January 6th, that, that, the, that we need to be showing America and showing the world that we can conduct an election that is actually democratic. That is, you know, the template and the role model uh, for democratic elections in this country. And, you know, that people need to do, uh, that poli we're not going to just let the politicians get billions of dollars from billionaire donors and then carpet bomb the country with advertisements and never actually have to shake a hand or meet a person, except in these, you know, highly staged rallies that they parachute in for once in a while where everybody in that rally is handpicked and, you know, and the whole thing is staged and it's kabuki theater, it's not politics. The thing that is most disturbing of what the DNC is doing here in New Hampshire and in Iowa, these were the two states where you actually had to do retail politics, where you had to come in and shake hands with people and meet people in diners and nail salons and barber shops and gas stations and answer the question from, you know, the old lady in, in Keene, New Hampshire, who reads The Economist every week and is, you know, obsessed with the Financial Times and is asking you a question, then a follow-up question and another that you'll never get from CNN or even from The Times. And that happens here and then people don't make up their mind. Oftentimes, so they go into the polling booth in New Hampshire. There, there, there's this wonderful culture in this state of skepticism, of questioning, of, you know, where you vet candidates for the rest of the nation the way that you would vet a, a city council candidate. And it's really important role for our country. And it, the same thing happens in Iowa, by the way. And the idea that the DNC has come in and just you know, pull the trap door under the two states where democracy actually happens is really insane to me. Uh, but I, you know, I think you do have a choice. You can go to the polls. Uh, you can vote for me or, you know, an, another candidate, and you can show that you still believe in democracy in the state of, of New Hampshire. Thanks. Almost out of time, Mr. Kennedy. I'll have one last question for you. You know, you mentioned your father's legacy. I'm curious, among your siblings and your cousins, who's supporting you? Who supports me? Um, my brothers, my brother Douglas, my sister Courtney. Um, uh, my, my, uh, I have a cop. I have one sister 
who, uh, who sends me notes every day that are very supportive, but she works for the Biden administration, so I don't want to <laughs> disclose her name. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have a lot of people, my kids, my kids all support me, but uh, they don't, let's be honest, <laughs> they don't really have a choice. I have a lot of them are still on the payroll at my house. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then um, I, they have a lot of cousins who are very excited about my candidacy. And, you know, I got, because I went on Joe Rogan a couple days ago, and they all, that, that generation all watches Joe Rogan, and they all send me really, really great messages. Um, and then uh, my, probably among my cousins, my strongest supporter is Anthony Shriver, who is uh, my cousin who I love, who started Best Buddies. And, but generally speaking, I have a lot of, I feel, you know, listen, I grew up in a family where we were encouraged every night to, not only encouraged, but basically uh, forced to argue with each other on different issues. And so we, you know, we would go to the dinner table every night and have these very, very passionate arguments and disagree with each other. My grandfather did that to my father's generation. And my grandmother would make us do the same thing. So we were raised with the idea that you can disagree with each other on issues and that you can still love each other. And I feel very loved by my family. I don't feel, I, I feel like, you know, they disagree with me. My, I, I have siblings who, passionately disagree with my position on the Ukraine, um, that passionately disagree with my position on vaccines. And, you know, they're entitled to their opinion. I don't begrudge them that. And, you know, so I think Biden represents their thoughts better than I, than I do. And they should go ahead and vote for them. But I, you know, I can love them anyway. And that, I think, is something that I hope for our whole country, that we can, you know, we can disagree with each other without hating each other. Mr. Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us on Conversation with the Candidate. Thank you to the audience, and thank you to everyone watching at home. Thank you very, very much. Let me go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great job. Did you, did you